Fires, floods, storms, famine, the effects of climate change are all around us. And according to a new essay penned by Bill McKibben, it is, shrink it is shrinking our world. Not livably, not literally, excuse me, but livably. The poorest and most vulnerable will pay the highest price. But already, even in the most affluent areas, many of us hesitate to walk across a grassy meadow because of the proliferation of ticks bearing Lyme disease, which have come with the hot weather. We have found ourselves unable to swim off beaches because jellyfish, which thrive as warming seas kill off other marine life, have taken over the water. The planet's diameter will remain 8,000 miles, and its surface will still cover 200 million square miles. But the Earth, for humans, has begun to shrink under our feet and in our minds. To scientists, the effects aren't surprising, but the response from all of us has been. We as a global society have turned the other way as our governments have either ignored or denied the problem. It has been going on for decades, and it's getting worse today. As the New Yorker's Jane Mayer so aptly put it today on Twitter, the West is on fire, the South is drowning, and Trump to nominate Andrew Wheeler, climate change denier and coal lobbyist, as permanent head of EPA. Joining me now by phone, distinguished professor of meteorology at Penn State's Earth Science Center, Michael Mann. He's also the author of The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. Michael, I'm sorry we couldn't get the studio working at the last minute, but we're so happy that you were able to join us by phone. Um, I, I, you've been discussing this, and you've been um, trying to, to make people hear you on climate change and start to do something about it and governments have started to do something about it for some time now. I read that New Yorker article today and I thought, gosh, how pointless is my life and how pointless is the, are the decisions that I'm making on a day to day basis when we are not focused on climate change every day when it's not leading every one of our newscasts. Well, thank you, Katie. It's great to be with you. And I, and I really appreciate you bringing some attention to this issue. It, it's true. I mean, climate change is no longer a far off, uh, subtle threat. It is impacting us now where we live in our daily lives. It's playing out on our television screens in terms of the tragedies we see with these latest California wildfires, devastating superstorms that have hit Texas, Puerto Rico, North Carolina, unprecedented floods, droughts, heat waves. This is the face of climate change, and we're dealing with it now. And when you read uh, Bill McKibben's article in The New Yorker, he talks about how he wrote about this 30 years ago and wrote about what could happen 30 years ago, and his worst dreams were realized. Uh, I've, I've got a couple points from him that I want to get to about why that is. But in looking around the world today and looking around the way we treat the planet, it seems pretty clear that we are, as he said, retreating. I mean, there are flood zones that are not getting repopulated along the coast. There are hurricane zones where people won't be able to rebuild. The Mekong Delta in Vietnam, people are leaving there. It's been a fertile environment forever. It's no longer as fertile because of salt water that's coming in. You see evidence of this and, and examples of it more and more. But when you go further yes. into the interior, then what you're dealing with are record temperatures. temperatures that get sure. into the 120 and above degrees Fahrenheit in some places. So the amount of space, it seems, that we're going to be able to occupy on this planet in the decades to come is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. No, that's absolutely right. And we're using more of that space now uh, for agriculture, for uh, other uh, human purposes. Um, so literally, the amount of land available to us is shrinking at a time when our global population is increasing. It's at about seven and a half billion people, uh, likely to hit nine billion later this century. And so we're talking about less food, less water and less space for a growing global population. And that's a recipe for a disaster, a disaster that is unfolding slowly in real time. Pakistan in June of this year reached 129 degrees Fahrenheit in Pakistan. Just an, an incredible number. Um, yeah. When we look at what could have changed before now, what we could have done, I was struck by um, the 
struck by a moment in the article where he talks about ExxonMobil and how ExxonMobil yeah. knew in 1977 that carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and the burning of fossil fuels, they knew back then that it was going to change the environment, that it was going to up the temperature of the globe. And they knew, because they knew, they went out and they made sure that their company was going to be in a good place for it. They raised yeah. drilling platforms, literally raised drilling platforms because they knew the oceans would rise. They accounted for losing oil and ability to, to drill oil in the Arctic. They did this. But then later on, what they did in order to sustain the profits for their company, according to the reporting, was go out and say, hey, listen, if, if the public understands this and is on one page about it, if they understand and accept that the science behind this does not look good for us, then the public will get governments to change and we will lose our profits. So what we need to do, according to the reporting and according to this New Yorker article, is we need to go out there and we need to muddy the water. We need to make it a question whether or not climate change is actually real. We need to make it that so that there's debate between scientists. Right. And the reality is, according to pretty much everybody, Michael, in your industry, yeah. there's no real debate. No, that's right. And we've seen, we've heard this story before. Uh, back in the 1950s, the tobacco industry knew that their product was killing people, killing millions of people. And rather than owning up to that and doing something uh, about it, they simply doubled down um, in a campaign of uh, disinformation and deceit uh, to lead our public and policymakers astray, to hide the impacts of their product. And ultimately, they were brought to justice in a major lawsuit um, for um, those actions. Well, you know, that's the same playbook that the tobacco uh, industry used in past decades is being used by the fossil fuel industry today. And you might be surprised to learn that some of the same scientists who served as paid advocates for them attempting to debunk the science linking tobacco and human uh, health uh, concerns like uh, lung cancer, some of the same scientists are working today for the fossil fuel industry attempting to debunk the overwhelming evidence for human-caused climate change. And it's really unfortunate because the toll taken by the continued denial of climate change and the delay of taking the actions necessary to avert catastrophic climate change, the number of people who will be killed by that uh, dwarfs the number of people who were uh, killed uh, by the use of tobacco products. So we're talking about a uh, potentially even greater crime against, you know, I would say humanity, but the, the planet itself.